Okay, let's get started. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for today's CNCF webinar, Admission Controllers, one part of your Kubernetes security and governance toolkit. I'm Jerry Fallon, and I will be moderating today's webinar. And we would like to welcome our presenters today, Bujan Patel, Cloud Architect at Palo Alto Networks, and Robert Haynes, Cloud Security Evangelist at Palo Alto Networks. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, so please feel free to drop your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. So please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of the Code of Conduct. Please be respectful of your fellow participants and presenters. And please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io slash webinars. With that, I'll hand it over to Robert and Gujan for today's presentation. Thanks very much, Gerald. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, so just quickly, a uh, quick intro I'll do myself, and then I'll let Gunjan say, say a couple of words. Robert Haynes, I work as a cloud security evangelist at Palo Alto Networks. Um, my role is to get out there and talk about all things to do with security, especially cloud and cloud native technology security. Gunjan, tell them about yourself. Hey everyone, my name is Gunjan. Um, I'm a senior cloud architect here at Palo Alto Networks. Um, and um, I have been working on Kubernetes uh, and containers for the last five years as a developer and architect um, at many open source projects, um, including Kubernetes and CNI. Yeah, so just if any, anyone's in any doubt, he is the smart one of the of the pairing this morning. Um, so, as we said, let's just uh, this is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to try and take about forty-five for fifty minutes, maybe slightly less, to to go through this. Um, we'll have a bit of time for Q and A at the end, depending on how many tangents I get off onto during our um, during onto our, our presentation this morning. I'm I'm going to give a real quick, short security overview of my my view of of Kubernetes security from like ten thousand feet. Um, and Jan's going to go into the um, the uh, details of, of OPA and uh, the Rigo language. Um, then we're going to take a look at some practical admission control policies, you know, things you should, you should think about doing and that you can use admission control for. And then we've got some examples and a, and a demo to go through at the end. So um, I'm, I'm a fairly, you know, like high level, I take a fairly high level view of things about what the attack vectors are going to be. In, in any kind of environment. And when you look at Kubernetes, there's really kind of like um, four or five main ways that someone's gonna try and compromise or misuse a Kubernetes cluster based on the architecture of Kubernetes itself. Um, at the very beginning, you gotta think about the container. Um, we're not gonna go into a ton about container security today. That's a whole other, whole other webinar about what goes in there. But if you think about what's inside a container, you know, it's got, code, it's got libraries that you've included. So software supply chain attacks you need to think about. Then you need to think about how the how the container's running. You know, is it running as a privileged container? Is it mounting the coast file system? Is it sharing network space? What can it connect to? Is it storing secrets in there? You know, all these things are important container security because that runs on the node and on the node also runs things like console. So there's a great um, Great story that um, someone posted some medium article actually, and it's like, how did how did crypto miners end up on our production Kubernetes uh, clusters? And essentially, they had a, a workload monitoring console. This wasn't the main Kubernetes cluster; it was a third-party console, been left open to the outside world, didn't have any authentication, and could run um, arbitrary commands on running containers because of how it was set up. So that was a great vector for someone to come in and relatively easy compromise um, a, a container. And also because the container was running with privileges and with file system mounts, they were able to then compromise the node as well. Um, you know, everything that happens in, inside of Kubernetes, every configuration change goes via the, the API server. So protecting your API server is important against misuse and against denial of service. Um, and obviously, etcd is again a kind of key component. 
and you can compromise, so firewalling it. Um, you can take it down, so protecting it from DDoS is important. And that kind of covers the, the real big chunks of, of Kubernetes vulnerabilities. So we obviously need to be able to work out how we're gonna, how we're gonna mitigate those. Um, and there's all this technology which we don't have time to talk about in one webinar, but they're all relatively important things that you should be thinking about. You know, cloud native firewalls, scanning your container images. There's tons of tools out there for, for looking at what's inside a container image and comparing it to, to CVEs. Runtime defense, you know, container, cloud native firewalls, application layer firewalls. How do we, how do we manage consoles? Again, cloud style firewalls, access control into there. Um, following your node, having runtime defense on your node, your node is still a, a Linux VM or a Linux physical box, depending on where you're running it. So you need to think about how you protect that, that actual node running it in itself as if it was just a standard server you weren't running Kubernetes on. You need to think about that. Um, you need to think about admission control in that space. API misuse, um, there's RBAC in Kubernetes. Um, RBAC everywhere is always a and you know, infrastructure uh, IAM in general is kind of a, always a complicated tack. You know, etcd, firewall, encrypt, limit access. Today we're going to talk a lot about admission controllers. Um, those are the kind of key things that we want to discuss today because they have a really powerful role to play in essentially limiting the effects of any kind of compromise. Um, I, I, I think take a, again, a fairly sort of simplistic view of these things. Um, there, I always think of them as like a firewall or an application layer firewall, but for your control plane in Kubernetes. So the admission control process um, lets you control what events, or not what events hit your API, but what your API does with those events when they come in. So, you know, we'll, we'll go into that in way more detail um, in a few minutes. So, this is where the delicate uh, ballet act of me handing over the screen to to Jan happens because he knows all about OPA or Open Policy Agent in far more detail that, than I do. So he's the right person to talk through it. So if you're ready, I'm going to stop sharing and you can start sharing. All right. Thanks, Robert. No worries. I will also turn on my camera. So oh, he's just better looking than I am. <laughs> All right, so, um, so thanks Robert for that introduction um, about different security um, attack vectors um, and what are some of the mitigation strategies. Now, as the webinar title says, uh, we're going to look at admission controller and uh, uh, as one part of that security toolkit. Uh, in specific, we'll look at open policy agent. Um, which is a CNCF uh, open source project. So what happens typically is you have your client, uh, which, which is you typically uh, either kubectl or Helm or Terraform, what are used to create Kubernetes objects. That request goes to the API server and then API server will make it happen. You know, there's like an action associated with it. Um, with an admission controller, or OPA in this case, there's we are adding an additional step. When the request gets to the API server, uh, there's a query sent to OPA um, and it will check against all the policies that you've created uh, to see if this action is allowed. If this action uh, on this resource is allowed by this user at this time, whatever you want. And it will give uh, back at a decision and then based on that there's a yes or no uh, on the action so let's try to zoom into this a little bit um, so how does an object creation work in kubernetes um, so here we'll try to look at it through an animation so here's um, you sitting with a smiley face um, uh, that's and you're using kubectl with your kubeconfig file to create a Kubernetes pod. So uh, you, you type kubectl create and then you, you're creating a pod, right? That request goes to Kubernetes API server. Um, and these are all the, all the, everything you see here in blue is uh, the control plane components in Kubernetes. Uh, that is stored 
that object you're you're trying to create it's stored in etcd database um, and then you get a success back um, if there was an issue with your schema or if you didn't have the proper authentication you'd get an error right here um, the scheduler and controller manager are uh, controllers that are always watching for new objects they'll get uh, they'll watch and not notice this change scheduler will quickly assign a node uh, to this pod and say this node seems to have uh, some extra space so schedule it here so we'll look at that node what happens on that node you have all these data plane components that are present on every node right you have your uh, kubelet you have your cni uh, docker daemon or cri daemon uh, and kubeproxy so what happens here is Kubelet notices that it has a pod that is supposed it's supposed to schedule. So uh, Kubelet will coordinate the pod creation. Uh, first, it will create a pod network namespace uh, and notify Docker daemon or CRI daemon to create containers inside it, one or more containers. Then it will send a, an add command to CNI. Uh, CNI is container networking interface that goes depending on which CNI you're using. Um, it will create a network interface for the pod, assign an IP address uh, to make sure this pod can talk to all the other pods um, in the cluster. And then Kubelet will say it's success, that pod has been scheduled. Kubeproxy notices, uh, notices that change and it will add that pod as an endpoint if there is a service using IPVS or IP tables. So this is a very high level overview of how an object is created. Um, now in this process, let's try to zoom into step one, two, and three from when you create an, a Kubernetes object um, and then you get a success back, which is number three. Inside the API server, there's a whole bunch of things that, go, that are going on. First thing is the HTTP API handler. When you do a kubectl create, it's handling your API request. The next thing it goes through is uh, authentication and authorization. It will make sure that you are who you say you are. Uh, that's, you know, that you're providing through kubeconfig here and authorization to show that you have the right credentials to do, sorry, uh, you are authorized to make this change, uh, to work on this operation. That's that's something you define in Kubernetes RBAC, for example. After you pass that, there's mutating admission webhooks where you can have something where you want to insert something or mutate the object before it gets stored in, onto etcd. After that, there's schema validation to make sure that uh, the schema you have specified is a um, sorry, the object you're creating is uh, the correct schema for the API version you are using. Uh, this is where all your typos and wrong YAML syntax will be caught and rejected. That After the schema, yeah, um, Robert is very famous for <laughs> mistyping things. <laughs> um, After that, there's admission, uh, validating admission webhooks. Uh, step 1.6 and 1.7. This is where OPA comes in. Uh, after your object schema is validated, it's sent to OPA or some external uh, admission, uh, admission controller. It will review it and then return the response back. And if, the, if it says OK, then it's stored onto etcd and then you get a success back uh, in kubectl. So let's take a look at, let's zoom into that um, here, step 1.6 and 1.7. What happens uh, from your object to the admission controller, especially in case um, of OPA. So you have your Kubernetes object YAML file, and then through kubectl, you're specifying uh, what you're trying to do. Let's say create or update list. Um, some operation on the object. Within the API server, 
there is a request form called admission review request where the Kubernetes object is embedded into that request. Um, and operation that you're trying to perform using um, using kubectl or whatever tool you're using. Uh, that's also embedded in that re admission review request. Uh, that goes to your uh, that goes to OPA in this case as a query in JSON format. OPA is checking against all the policies you have created in advance. Um, that's using Rego policy language that we'll cover in a bit. Um, and then it will see, it will check uh, all the policies to see if this exact admission review request, this object um, and this operation is allowed to be performed. Um, and then it will send back a decision as, um, as admission review response object um, back to the API server. Um, and based on the response, you get either stored onto etcd or user gets an error saying you're not allowed to do this right now. So kind of a stupid analogy that I like to use for this process is, um, uh, you know, when you go to nightclubs, um, I know we're not supposed to go there right now uh, because of all this pandemic, um, but there's usually a bouncer who has a list of all the guests um, and there's a line Every time a new person comes in, the, uh, the bouncer will check their name against uh, that list they have. So you can think of OPA as that bouncer and all the Rego policies as that list and all the objects and everything you create, update, delete in Kubernetes, all those objects and operations are the people standing in line uh, to be admitted to the nightclub. So anyway, that's um, that's my stupid analogy. So let's quickly take a look at the Rego language that we're using to create these policies. So some language basics, there are variables. Um, you can assign uh, some value to the variables uh, using this syntax. And these are not like, you know, you don't have to predefine X is an integer type. You can just say X colon equals 42 and it will create and assign that value if it already doesn't exist uh, to X. It can be a string or Boolean uh, or, you know, uh, a composite data type. Equality, you can equate x equals equals 42, that returns a Boolean if it's true. Uh, not equals, uh, you can compare to strings, compare a variable with a number greater than equal to or greater than less than. Um, there's also a race um, in Rego where you have um, multiple objects um, and they can be of any type in an array. And looking up things uh, is similar. You can have in an array, you can look it up by a specific index, um, or you can look it up by a specific key in a key value pair. Uh, in this case, object foo, that's looking up the foo index, whatever the value is there. Um, then if you have a nested object, which will most likely be the case, uh, if you're using Rego for admission controller, you can use the dot notation to go down the hierarchy. We'll see that one in a bit more detail. Uh, it also comes with a bunch of built-in uh, functions like um, starts with, to check if uh, a, a particular string starts with uh, this substring, ends with contains, trim, split, and count. This is so you don't have to perform a lot of um, string operations uh, manually. Um, iteration is uh, slightly different from other programming languages if you're used to them. Uh, let's say you have x equals um, an array of a couple of elements, right? You can have, you can say x of index, which is 0, 1, 2, 
Or if you want to iterate through them and assign all those values, you can say y equals, sorry, y colon equals x in square bracket underscore. That means it will assign all those values a, b, and c um, to y. You can also do a traditional for loop uh, using the keyword sum, sum of i uh, and x of i. It will go through a, b, and c, 0, 1, and 2 indexes, uh, and double for loop sum of i and j. Now let's take a look at how a Kubernetes object will look like um, um, in a, as an admission review object, right? You have a very simple Kubernetes object YAML file. Uh, this is a pod, um, name is my app and container image is Nginx and the name is Nginx frontend. So when it gets to OPA, it will look like this admission review JSON object. Uh, you have a larger field called input, and then you have admission review object. Um, then there's a request kind for pod type version. And then in the, in the object uh, field, you have metadata, which has name, spec, uh, image. Uh, and notice this is a square bracket here and here. That means it's an array. Um, and you can go, there's a Rego, sample Rego playground link. Um, by the way, if you're not familiar with it, uh, the Rego playground is pretty cool. You can have, uh, you can evaluate the policies you write against different objects um, before you create and apply those to your admission controller. I was just about to jump in and, and say the same. The, 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 uh, the open policy, the Rego playground is, is super useful if you're trying to develop policies. Um, depending on what, what environments you have to play with. I, I learned a ton just by sort of mess, messing around with that. Totally worth it. Yeah. And um, since we might have a little bit of time, let's click through it. Um, just want to quickly show you how it works, right? Uh, there are three main sections here. Input, you have your Rego policy here, and output. So in this predefined page, I have a sample object that's already there, right? It's a pod, admission review, um, and then there is a pod, and it has a label environment equals not dev dash 42. What this policy is saying here is uh, check if, check to make sure if, um, make sure that the, object that's being created has a label environment that starts with the dev. If we evaluate this, it says it's supposed to start with dev dash and not this, whatever you have. So what it's doing here is input here, which is this whole thing, dot request. Uh, this is the request object. Uh, which is here, metadata, labels, and environment, line 11 here. So it's assigning its value to the, the variable value. And if, it, if the value doesn't start, not start with dev dash, then it's, it's false, right? It's going to return false for this predefined deny statement. Uh, sorry, deny uh, function. All right, let's get back to this one. So here's another sample Rego uh, policy where you have a function called match uh, and it's, uh, you can return a message with, uh, with your allow or deny, whatever you want here. Input.request.operation. Now operation is also included. Uh, I didn't show it in the previous slide, uh, but you can also be very specific to which operation you want to apply this policy to create, update, uh, um, put, delete, uh, etc. If you don't specify that, it applies to all of them. 
the time you have to make sure this uh, this is there is if you're applying policies and you already have a bunch of resources created, uh, you may not be able to delete them afterwards if you don't have a specified operation. Kind dot kind um, is pod uh, resource is pods and this one is checking against uh, privileged containers. So input dot request object spec containers. Now you will see there's an underscore. That means it will, if you have more than one containers, it will go through them and assign them, evaluate them, each of them uh, one at a time. And security context and privilege. If that is true, then it will return true for match with a message saying privilege pods uh, denied. Now one gotcha here is init containers. In Kubernetes pod, you can have init, uh, init containers that are that don't follow the same structure. Uh, and then those ones, they can escape uh, this policy. A lot of people make that mistake. Uh, so make sure that is covered. All right, so how does a Rego policy look like? Um, you have this higher level policy um, and allow is a function, right? It's a rule uh, in this policy. Within that, um, within that uh, rule, you have statements, individual statements that you're evaluating. Um, and if you have multiple of those that return different Boolean values, they get, uh, there's an end operation for them. So input.val equals, uh, equals, equals 42, uh, list zero equals, equals caret. If both of them are true, then allow returns a true. Uh, same thing with the other allow, uh, right? And between those rules, they get ORed. So only one of them have to return true for the, the main allow to be true, right? Um, and you, you can specify a default value for allow up here, uh, which is false. Uh, you should always specify this as a best practice uh, to, fall, uh, to false or whatever the negative value you want to assign. Now, let's take a look at some security best practices um, for Kubernetes, right? The way um, I look at it is there's four main areas, integration touch points for security. Uh, one is in the development phase, then you have your CI CD phase, then pre deployment phase, um, and runtime. So, the things you can do here is uh, dev and DevOps checks is you can have some checks built into the uh, built into IDE uh, git pre commit checks uh, to follow security some of the security best practices. In the CI CD pipeline, you can have a whole bunch of IT governance uh, policies. You can also use uh, op OPA here in your CI CD pipeline to validate uh, the Kubernetes manifest you are checking in against uh, some compliance issues or uh, whatnot. Admission checks. Uh, this is where the admission control comes into picture, right? You can bypass CI CD. You can ignore ID error messages. Uh, you can merge the code however you want, right? There's no enforcement point there. With admission controller, it makes sure whoever is creating this resource is following these policies. There is no, you cannot bypass it, right? Even if it's a Kubernetes higher level object creating another pod, it has to go through the same admission review process. This is where you can check uh, for things like signed images, IT approved base images, uh, you're following security best practices, uh, or you're making changes at allowed business hours. Um, uh, sorry, not during uh, not during business hours. Um, and runtime checks. 
similar policies, you just look for violations in those. So let's take a look at uh, a couple of security best practices where you can use an admission controller for. Um, and then Robert will walk through uh, each of them uh, individually. So first one is only running your container from a trusted source. Uh, you don't want to run containers from you know, Docker Hub where anyone can uh, push things. You want, you want a trusted registry, your company's registry. Um, not allowing dash dev latest master image tags, right? Uh, a lot of times you have your CI CD pipeline set up where uh, every time a developer checks in new code uh, in let's say dev branch or master branch, um, which is called main branch now, uh, uh, Docker, uh, a Docker image is built in the CI CD and it's pushed against those tags um, in the repository. So not even by mistake, you want to use those. Same thing with latest. Uh, all these tags don't tell you which version you're using, right? Uh, so preventing those, um, that's good hygiene. Uh, not allowing privileged containers. This is kind of uh, very, uh, this very dangerous. If you're, if you're running a privileged container, it has access to the host and all the other containers file system, uh, which process it's running, uh, all the network calls, everything. So make sure you're, there should be very few exceptions to this. Not mounting uh, the host file system, um, like mounting etc var uh, of the host to the um, uh, to the pod. Uh, that means it can modify etc and var like uh, root of the host. And it's also not a be uh, best practice if your pod dies gets recreated somewhere else, uh, it doesn't have the same local file system anymore. Um, this one is important, making sure your container file system is read only. Uh, this check alone will get you a very high score in Metasploit uh, check because your container file system is read only. That means you cannot, if there's anything, uh, if there's any malware, um, it cannot download anything. It cannot execute anything. It's a read-only file system. All you can do is read. Um, and this is another good hygiene thing, uh, blocking services of type node port. Uh, you might have developers who just create a lot of, uh, they might bypass uh, and create public facing services uh, using node port service. So those are some of them. Um, uh, I have a GitHub repo here, uh, github.com slash dungeon file cloud native security, where I list a whole bunch of these uh, with risk score assigned to them. Uh, not all of them are applicable for admission controller, but you can go through them and see which ones you can apply and what tools you can use. So now I'll hand it over to Robert to go through uh, these use cases in more detail and show us the rego files. Okay, thanks very much. So um, full disclosure, I am using uh, the OPA, OPA implementation and emission control on Palo Alto's Prisma Cloud, but it doesn't actually affect how you would run any of this. It's just the easiest way for me to do the demo. Um, so let's just, uh, let's just start. Um, so let's have a look, let's just cat type in the right thing. Okay, here's my real simple piece of uh, Kubernetes YAML, okay? Um, it's just gonna start, all it does is start a, a pod running running Nginx. It's uh, pretty, pretty simple. So if I'm lucky and I can type, as we were discussing earlier. Um, see, I cannot type and I cannot type even more in front of an audience. So let's run this. I think this is waking up. Oh, okay. So my image, 
Nginx Lotus fails to come from a trusted repository registry. So let's just take a look at uh, like Gunjen's rules of, uh, of uh, container hygiene. So this is the rule that we're actually using. Um, it's not actually using hulu.com as the, as, the, uh, as the image start, but this is basically enforcing that my image comes from a trusted repository. So um, I think if I can't, I think now I should clear between each ones. Now I'm pulling my image from my, uh, this is my personal, uh, my personal Google uh, container image repository. This could obviously be anywhere, anywhere you like. So maybe this will work for me. So. Actually, yeah, yeah. Ah. Okay. So my image is tagged dev prod or lotus, which are not allowed. So let's go back to here. Okay. So this is the rule that's kicking in here. Um, again, it's just picking up the, the image. Um, is the image uh, got lotus master or, or dev as a tag? Um, and if it is, then I, I'm, I'm blocked. The way that we, we do the blocking in, um, in, in, in Prisma is any time that this matches, it's an automatic negative, but you could change this to deny. It's not, a, it's not like a language specific thing. Okay, so I think if I took it three, okay. So I've now used the deploy tag, which is very imaginative of me. So hopefully now I'm using a, uh, a trusted registry and I'm using a deploy tag. So let's just take a look now. Privilege escalation pod not allowed. Okay, so let's just click here. Okay. Um, so here I'm looking at this thing here for allow privilege escalation. Now, obviously, there's other ones we can do, like runner's root and a few other things you could throw in here, but to keep them simple, I just picked on allow privilege escalation. So let's have a look. So maybe if I take a look at... Okay, so now, if you notice before, I had privilege that was equal to true and privilege escalation was true and I had it running as root. You could pick on any one of those things and you should probably you should probably pick on all three of these things. So now let's see, we've got trusted registry, deploy tag, uh, no privilege escalation, running as a high numbered user. So hopefully, uh, see if this gets me there. Okay, so this is, I see, we're trying to mount the var, var directory. Now, there's a good argument that um, you shouldn't mount file systems of the host at all. But here I'm just demonstrating that we can, we can mount, um, we can mount sort of, uh, we can control which mounts might be allowed. Okay, so I'm, you know, if it starts with uh, etc, etc, if it starts with var, if it's just, just mount everything, then I'm going to stop that. Um, I, there are probably great arguments you could have about whether there's ever a good thing to mount a host file system or not. Um, but here's just a demonstration of how we can do. And you could actually, you could actually stop it if it was any kind of host path mentioned there at all. So um, let's take a look at, um, let's look at number five. Okay, so now I'm just mounting the home directory into slash mnt slash home. No, we could we could say is that good or bad, but I've decided to allow it in my in my environment. So now I'm using privileged container, uh, a, a trusted registry rather, deploy tag, no no privilege escalation, and a and a and a host path mount. I'm hopefully happy with. So let's um, let's try that. Let's clear the screen to make it slightly easier to see what's going on. So now number five will be the charm. Okay, we've got to have a read-only root for this file system because in Jen's rules of, of container hygiene, file system root, uh, read-only. Um, so let's have a look. Um, down here, this is basically looking for, I uh, get the continuity oh, up a bit. Not read-only root file system in there. Okay, you've got to have, um, not only has it got to be there, it's got to be set to false. Um, so there we go. Um, so if I take a look at 
Okay, so now I have a trusted registry, deploy tag, file system mounts I'm comfortable with, no escalation, and read only file system is set to true. So, and I've been successful. So basically this, this whole chain of stuff has forced me to apply a set of good hygiene to my, my pod creation. Um, but there was one other rule, prevent node port services. Um, essentially, I really want all of my traffic to be going through proper ingress control, load balancer type objects. I don't really want to create a node port because that potentially exposes my container to, um, to the outside world without any of the controls in my environment. So just flick back to here. And let's just take a look at... Uh, I've imaginatively named this. This is just a real simple, you know, service, node port, selects for the app, my app, um, listens on port 80, uh, node port 3007. 3, so, and again, because the rules kicked in and has and uh, spotted that it's node port, um, I have been unable to do it. Now these are simple, um, simple rule sets. Um, you know, you can build multiple, multiple uh, kind of detections in each one. You can, uh, you can make your message as long and as unpleasant as you like. Um, there's, it's easier in some ways, depending on your implementation. I think to keep rules separately rather than trying to combine them into into one one mega rule because a it allows you to create um you know different different rules for different places it's slightly more portable um i find dealing with large chunks of, of rule text um that have multiple matching statements in it slightly more complicated um so there we go with that um I, I personally like to do it this way, that there are other, definitely other ways you can put these rule sets together. So um, I think we'll take, actually, let's take some questions because there seems to be a bunch of questions that have come through in this last, this last environment. Um, probably I won't be able to ask a that, that may answer that many of them, which is why I brought my cleverer friend with me. Um, Hey Robert, do you want to switch over to the resources slide? So yeah, sure. So we can do that. Uh, um, if they want to take a note, this will um and these slides will obviously be available later on anyway. So you can you can get to these. Um, the policies that we use today were in this GitHub repository. The first thing, um, there is a subdirectory of the OpenRigo policies called uh, I think CNCF webinar. You can look in there. Um, that we have a blog on container security best practices, which is uh, what we've been referencing today. The last two are specifically around how we at Prisma Cloud have um, implemented OPA support and um, how we've done uh, ingress control, uh, how we've done admission control in, in there. So it's, that is quite specific to, uh, to Prisma Cloud technologies. Um, <clears throat> with that, what we've got sort of 10 minutes or so left to go to answer some questions. Um, I don't know if how we want to uh, to deal with those, but we can take them one at a time, or we can take a quick look through and see which is the most relevant to go. Um, I can help facilitate the questions. No uh, problems. Um, thank you both, first of all, for a wonderful presentation. Um, as Robert said, we have about ten minutes or so before we wrap up. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, please uh, get uh, feel free to drop them in. Um, we have several here. The first one. Here, um, if possible, can we go a bit deeper on how common policy repository, um, time state analysis, and admission control are working together along with the CI CD pipeline that results in production deployment? I'm not so sure. I can give it, I uh, my answer will be, um, uh, Will be won't be vendor neutral. Um, I just want to put that there because I my familiarity is with the Prisma Cloud platform, which has agents and components that can integrate into everything from IDE uh, 
through um, source code repositories, through build servers, through um, container registries. So, uh, and then into actual runtime in, in production in, in with admission control. So yes, we, we can do that. Um, I think, I think it makes, however you choose to do it, whether you use a combination of open source tools and, and other stuff, it does make uh, a lot of sense to do that. I think that, you know, good container hygiene policy is good container hygiene policy. And if you can try and enforce the same set of policies at every sensible step in your in your build pipeline, that to me makes complete sense. Um, I think that the, the advantage that, um, and you should do it, you should make it so that, you know, as a developer, and I'm using, you know, an IDE of choice like IntelliJ or whatever. I should be able to submit my um, my YAML for um, for evaluation at that point before I even commit it, because I personally don't like to break builds and and make mistakes. So anytime I can get a piece of technology to help me and show me where I'm going wrong, I'm I'm usually fairly grateful. A little frustrated sometimes, but fairly fairly grateful. So I think having those checks and having those sanity checks at every possible stage that you can put in that's that's not doesn't cause too much friction and, and trouble is a good idea <clears throat> the the advantage of um of, of doing things with admission control is that you kind of it's a it's a it's very hard to get around it's very hard to avoid it's impossible well uh, impossible is the wrong word it's very difficult to avoid the admission control process you can try and write your way around the rules but you, you know, essentially, once you've installed admission control and an OPA agent into Kubernetes, then every API call goes through it. So you can't, you know, fudge the build or anything like that. Okay. This next question here: Is it possible to get all the violations at once instead of one at a time? You could certainly write a big rule that looked for every single exception and built um, built a bigger message. Um, yeah. But, and which I can see is, is better in lots of ways, but I, I don't know, I, I have questions about maintainability and, and how easy it is. It depends who's doing them. Um, like, like you have on this, in the, on this webinar today, um, Myself, who actually has a background in sysadmin and security, and my esteemed colleague, who's a developer, and our brains clearly don't work the same half the time, um, as we've discovered whilst putting this presentation together. And so, so for me, for me, I would probably put up with extra pain um, and maybe slight lack of optimization in the res responses for ease of maintenance and ease of comprehension. Um, because I'm not great when shown um, pages and pages of code. But other people may have, you know, it kind of depends who's maintaining it and who's managing it, I would say. Yeah, I would say you can jam in multiple uh, exceptions, uh, sorry, um, multiple rule violations into the message. Um, uh, but it's... Uh, uh, as as Robert said, like I wouldn't jam all of them into the single uh, into one message because admission review response object only has one string. Uh, you can definitely append uh, to that message, so you can have all the evaluations in separate uh, rules, uh, but you have one global variable message where you keep appending uh, bullet points uh, style saying violation one, two, three, four, um, and that's returned at the end. Uh, but maintainability point of view, uh, you don't wanna have a, a, a ginormous rule that has all those checks in one. Uh, you still want them separate. Uh, you can just, um, up, uh, sorry, prepend to the message uh, in each of those rules. Okay, so our next question here, how do we manage exceptions? Uh, there are no exception handling in Drago. Uh, there are some cases where you can have error message errors, uh, but those will be compile time errors. Um, 
hopefully whatever you're using for OPA um, implementation uh, or the OPA server itself would it would reject the policy uh, if you have if you let's say you already have created an, a variable and try to assign another value to it um, it will throw an error message but there are no exceptions can I apply a rule only to a specific namespace um, you can check for it in the um, Rigo uh, policy. You can say uh, object uh, whatever dot namespace equals equals this namespace. Um, and then uh, because if you remember that slide, all those um, statements, they get end, uh, logical end. So it will rest of it will only apply if the namespace equals equals uh, the specific namespace. Can you do math with Rego rules, for example, to force on a container um, that memory limit? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, if I understand it correctly, uh, yes, you can do that. Uh, memory dot, you can get values from memory dot limit and memory dot um, request. Uh, and then, you know, those are, um, those are variables. So you can uh, get those values, do the math on it, and then make a decision based on that. How do you recommend to protect the control plane from attacks? ECD, API server, et cetera. Robert, you want to take this? Um, uh, yeah, so I think there's, there's a, careful, to, I, I say I have a slight a, a vendor, um, vendor take on this, but you can, there's a bunch of really good, uh, security out there in terms of like when you can look up best practices that don't involve any any third party tools but essentially um limiting i think there's some it's important to limit which which nodes can access um etcd so there's sort of firewall there's uh mission control uh, there's uh firewalls you can put in third party firewalls if you if you need to keep things away um there is um mutual tls between between uh, you know your etcd and communications in your api communications should be uh, potentially be uh, encrypted um uh, we could go on there are there, i did i did hunt around and i found a number of really well, well written blogs on on this um so i encourage you to go and check those out rather than listen to me babylon if opa is outside how is the context of the environment passed into the input to opa Ah, so even if it's inside the cluster, um, well, sorry, uh, let's use that uh, example. If it's outside the cluster, um, in the admission review request, uh, number one, uh, it comes from a specific API server, right? Uh, but OPA doesn't have anything built in to distinguish um, where it's coming from or evaluate that as part of the policy. Uh, one sort of hack I could think of um, is if you remember that uh, slide where we zoomed into what happens inside the API server, uh, one of the step is mutating admission webhook where you can mutate, um, you can have a simple mutating admission webhook that just adds a label saying cluster equals cluster name uh, and add that context. Uh, to all the objects and before it gets to uh, schema validation and ultimately to admission controller. So when the request gets to the admission controller, it has um, a label environment equals this or cluster name equals this. That's one hack I could think of off the top of my head. Do you recommend using Istio service mesh? Yeah, it, it depends. Um, but if you're talking about in context of uh, OPA, um, yes, um, 
it, it depends on your use case, right? Um, Istio service mesh is uh, a whole another uh, topic for another talk, but there's an uh, OPA plugin for Istio uh, to extend your validation or admission control in uh, for Istio objects and authentication authenticate um, the request request. Okay, well, that just about wraps up all the time that we have for today. I want to thank you, John and Robert, for a wonderful presentation. And I also want to thank everyone for taking time out of their day for joining us today. Um, as I said before, today's recording and slides will be posted on the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io. Everyone, thank you again for your time today. Please take care, stay safe, and we will see you all next time. Thank you. Thanks a lot.